Well, good morning. It is great to see you again. So glad that you have chosen to spend a little time with us here at Sunlight this morning. Welcome to all those who are viewing us from home or wherever you might be viewing us. It's great to have you as a part of our time this morning as well. Last weekend, we were supposed to have Backyard Fellowship at our home. We canceled it because of the weather, so we rescheduled it for tonight. We've had a couple of people that were not able to come tonight because of some other act or other events that they had on the schedule already. So if you would like to join us tonight for Backyard Fellowship, just let Pat or I know before you leave today that you would like to come, and we'll make sure that we get your name on the guest list, and the dog will let you on the property. And uh, so it is great. It's going to be a wonderful time. The weather promises to be wonderful tonight, so we are looking forward uh, to that time to get together. Well, the other morning I was looking out the back windows of our house and into the backyard, and I was hit with the thought that we're going to need some firewood for the winter. Now, I realize that not many people think of fire in the fireplace when it's 95 degree outside, but for the moment, that was the thought that popped into my mind. Now, Pat and I use a significant amount of wood in the winter as we like the warmth that wood brings into the house instead of just using the furnace all the time. But the only problem with a fireplace is that you need to keep the flame going on it or it'll burn down and allows the house to get cold. Now, we've also learned over the years that it is much easier to keep the fire burning once it's going instead of letting it go out and needing to repeat the whole process again. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking and speaking about the idea of keeping the fire burning, reigniting the passion for Christ that should be with inside of us and making sure that that is something that each and every one of us have. The creative force behind all great art, all great drama, all great music, all great architecture, all great writing is passion. Never Nothing great has ever been accomplished in life without passion. Nothing great is ever sustained in life without passion. Passion is what energizes life. Passion makes the impossible possible. Passion gives you a reason to get up in the morning and go, I'm going to do something with my life today. Without passion, life becomes boring. It can become monotonous. It can become routine can become dull. God created us with the emotions to have passion in our life, and he wants us to live a passionate life. Passion is what mobilizes armies into action. Passion is what causes explorers to go boldly where no man has gone before. Passion is what causes scientists to spend late night hours trying to figure out what a cure is for a dreaded disease. Passion is what takes a good athlete and turns him or her into a great athlete. You've got to have passion in your life. Now, as I was preparing for this message, I thought I would see what kind of definition I could find for the word passion. And I must admit, I was a little hesitant to Google the definition of passion, but I was pleased to find this definition. It says, a strong and barely controllable emotion. A strong and barely controllable emotion. I also found some synonyms of the word passion to be eagerness, enthusiasm, fever, zeal. One day a man walked up to Jesus and he asked Jesus, he said, Jesus, what's the most important thing in the Bible? Out of all the stuff in the Bible, what is the most important thing that you would have for him? Well, we know of the great commandment. We've talked about it a number of times, but we find it in Mark 12, 30, where it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Nothing matters more than that, Jesus says. Well, that's the number one thing in life. I want you to love me passionately. Nothing else matters in life if you don't love God passionately. God doesn't want you to love him half-heartedly. He wants you to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. In the message version of the Bible, it paraphrases this passage in this way. It says, love the Lord God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence and energy. And the word passion appears in this version, and the Greek word for passion is heart. 
God is saying, I want you to put some muscle into it. I want you to put some energy into it. I want you to put some emotion into your relationship with me. I want you to put your heart into your relationship with me. Don't be half-hearted. Give it all you've got. If you're going to follow me, Jesus says, you've got to do it with passion. You've got to do it with some oomph, some spark, some zip, some enthusiasm, some zest. We have to decide if we're going to live passionately. In fact, this truth is all throughout the Bible. The Bible tells us that we're to seek God passionately. We're to love God passionately. And the Bible says that we're to serve and obey God passionately. The Bible says that we're to do all of these things. Everything we do unto the Lord should be done passionately. We're to trust God passionately. Then, as if we don't get the message, in Colossians 3.23, it says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. He says, I want you to do everything passionately when it comes to loving me, serving me, living for me. But here's the heartbreaking thing. In America, it's okay to be passionate about everything and anything except God. It's not politically correct to be passionate about God. I can be passionate about movies. I can be passionate about sports. I can be passionate about politics. I can be passionate about fashions and clothes, and I can be passionate about restaurants and coffee shops and hair and nail salons, but I cannot be passionate about God. That's a no-no. And within this age of information, if you would have the time to sit down at your computer and type in the phrase, a passion for, under Amazon, under books, you would find books that are titled Passion for Birds, for Books, Cactus, Fashion, Flying, Gardening, Hunting, Needlepoint, Sewing, Pasta, Potatoes. The list is almost endless. In our culture, it's okay to be passionate about anything except religion, except your faith, except your relationship with God. I can go to a rock concert or a political rally or a baseball game, and I can shout my head off. I can get excited. I can get hoarse from yelling so loud. When my team loses, I can cry. Nobody thinks that's a big deal. When my team wins, I can jump up and down and wave my hands all in the air. But if, but if I do that at a game, people say, now that is a real fan. That is a real fan. But if I do that in church, people say, he's a fanatic. He's a nutcase. You don't want to get too emotional about your faith. It's okay about everything else, but not that. Romans 12, 11 says this, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, if you notice in that verse, there is the word keep. And the inclusion of that word means that zeal or passion or the fire that is to burn within us is not automatic. It's a choice. It's a discipline. It's something you must maintain. Because we are not by nature passionate about God. It's something that we must choose to do. We get distracted and everything in life conspires to keep us from being passionate about God. So he says, keep your passion going. Keep the fires going. It's a discipline. It's not an automatic. This kind of thing, being passionate about God, has nothing to do with either your personality or your age. Because over the years, this church has been filled with many senior believers who have walked with God a long, long time, and their passion has, has just been there from day one. And some of them continued to walk that, that passionate life until God called them home until their reward. And others today are still walking around with that same passion going that they have inside of them, looking forward to that day when God calls them home. Every one of us, if we took a little time, could come up with a list of those spirit-filled believers who have had a marvelous influence in our lives. 
who have lived a life of passion before us, who gave us an example of what a true Christian should look like. And you and I need to have that same passion and fire reignited in our lives for those people behind us to be able to see. The problem is that everything in life conspires to keep us away from being passionate. And when all of these forces come against us, it causes our energy to dissipate. If I were to have some helium balloons with me this morning and I let them go into the sanctuary, they would rise up to the ceiling and for a time they would stay there. But it would not be long before they would start to lose some of the helium and float back down to the ground. Their passion or fire would begin to go out. You know, a lot of times we're like that. When, when you first become a believer, when you really understand what a good deal it is that you got accepted by Christ and he forgave you of your sin, we say, that's a great deal. That's a fantastic deal. I can't get any better than this. All my sins are forgiven. I now have a purpose for living. I now have a future home in heaven. What a deal. What a deal. And you get excited about that. When you give your life to Christ and, and, and you're pretty passionate. But as time goes by, you begin to lose your steam. You begin to lose your zip, your zest, your enthusiasm. When someone comes to Christ, there's a great celebration that takes place. In fact, in Luke 15, it tells us that there's great rejoicing in heaven. It happens when one sinner comes to the Lord. We rejoice when those events happen. But I also let the person know who has prayed that, who has prayed and asked for forgiveness, that we will be praying for them in the week ahead due to the fact that Satan is not happy with the decision that you just made. And he's going to try everything he can to cause you to walk away from that decision. And that power that you feel today is going to diminish. And it's going to diminish because Satan is trying to do everything he can to cause you to walk away from that. And he wants to extinguish their fire. What happens? Why does that happen? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. As we go through God's word, we're going to look at seven passion killers, things that rob the joy out of your life. I thought it would be an appropriate message as we came off the series of the Ten Commandments. So we're going to look at those seven passion killers. And we're not going to be able to dive into all seven of them today. So we're going to finish up the message next Sunday. But as we go through these seven passion killers, I would suggest that you use them like a checklist to be able to see if one of them is causing your fire to burn down or even if it is out as we endeavor to reignite your passion for Christ. Because God says, I want you to love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Seven passion killers to keep us from doing that. Seven passion killers that, that can come into our life and cause that passion that we had at one time to go out. And the first one is this. An unbalanced schedule. An unbalanced schedule. This means that you are either overworked or you are underworked. If this is the case, then you're going to lose your passion for life and lose your passion for God. Because life is a series of seasons, the Bible says. There's a season for everything. There's a rhythm to life. And you need to keep both in your life, both input and output. You need both rest and work. And too much of either will cause you to lose your passion. Too much work will cause you to lose your passion. Too much nothing or boredom will cause you to lose your passion too if you're not working enough. If we were to take a poll of everyone this morning, it would be my guess that half of us this morning would need to work less, and the rest of us would need to work more. We're all different in our personalities. And you can go to either extreme. Psalm 127.2 says this, It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. 
That's a good verse to put on your refrigerator door. God wants us to get our proper rest. For some of you, the problem is you're always giving out. You're always helping. You're always sharing. You're always serving. You're always working. You're always being generous. And you never take time to recharge. And if you never take time to recharge, you've gotten yourself unbalanced. And you're going to eventually get compassion fatigue. What is compassion fatigue? Well, compassion fatigue is when you just stop caring. You don't care about God anymore. You don't care about other people anymore. You don't care about anything anymore. Why? Because you're burning out from too much work, from too much service. And when you care and care and care, eventually you're going to get compassion fatigue. On our last trip to Disney a few years ago, I bought this shirt, not because it's true, but because it's totally contrary to my personality. And this is what it says. Do I look like I care? In fact, I'll tell you, I'll share a little secret with you. I feel a little bit bad about wearing it in public because I don't want people to think that I don't care. At the opposite end of the spectrum this morning, there are people who are the exact opposite of those who are working too much. These are the people who, who are taking in, taking, 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 but never giving out. They go to Bible studies. They listen to teachers on the radio. They listen to tapes. They go to seminars. They go to Christian concerts. They go to workshops. They go to church all the time. They're always learning, always taking in, always growing in the input. But they're not giving any of it out. They don't have a ministry. They don't have a mission. And they're not really involved teaching or helping anybody. They're taking in a lot of knowledge, which is great. But sooner or later, some of that needs to be released by helping and working. Now, I'm not saying that this is one of the passion killers that you have, but many times this is the best place to start. You either have too much output and not enough input, or you've got too much input and not enough output. You've got to decide if that's one of your passion killers. And the best way to find out is ask God, God, is this me? Am I on one extreme or the other of that? Is that what's causing my passion to be dwindling down or maybe even going out? Am I giving out too much and not taking in enough? Am I taking in too much and not giving it back out? Where are you at in that? And that's the first one. Bible study without ministry is dangerous. And according to James, it's sinful. Because the Bible says in James 4, 17, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. You realize that the more you know about God's plan for your life, the more responsible you are to God for the knowledge that he has given to you? By knowing and taking in, all we are increasing our responsibility because God holds us accountable for what we know. So the Bible tells that you need both in your life, input and output. You need work and you need rest. You need balance in your schedule. So how do we get balance? Well, 1 Timothy 4, 7 says this, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. We need to train ourselves to be spiritually fit. And we do that by having balance in our lives. We all know to be physically fit, you have to have a balanced diet. And to be spiritually fit, you have to have a balance of God's five purposes in your life. And the first purpose is this. You need to have time to worship with God privately and corporately. You need that. You need to have both that quiet time by yourself and that corporate time of being together with believers. 
you need to have times when you're fellowshipping with other believers. Believe it or not, we have to fellowship with each other. It's a balance. It's one of those things that God wants us to have in our life. You got to have it. You need to have times when you're reading God's word and growing as a Christian. If you never pick up your Bible from Sunday to Sunday, then you are not in God's word and you're not growing as a Christian. It needs to be open. You need to be spending some time. You need to have it. You need to have times of ministry, service, when you're giving out and using your abilities. It needs to be a part of all of our lives. And you need to have times of mission when you're sharing your faith with others. We need to have a balance of all five of those things in our lives. Now, if we happen to get stuck on number two, then we're going to have lots of fellowship, but nothing else. Or if you get stuck on number three, then you're going to have lots of Bible study, but, but nothing else. You're going to become unbalanced, and you will inevitably lose your passion, and the fire that was once there will begin to fade and go out. You'll one day stop and ask yourself, how come I don't feel as close to God as I used to? And the answer is that you're out of balance. The second passion killer is this, an unused talent. An unused talent will cause you to lose your passion for life and your passion for God. 1 Peter 4.10 says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So we're supposed to use our gift well. Notice God gives you certain talents, abilities, a personality gift that shape who you are. He's given you those gifts, that, those talents that you've been given are not for your benefit. They're for the benefit of other people. My gift that God has given me is for your benefit. Your gift that God has given you is for my benefit. You're to use those gifts in the service of other people. God has given you a special role in this world. And he wants you to make a contribution with your life. God says, I have given you these gifts and talents. And if you don't use your talents, you're going to lose your passion. God did not give you special abilities, talents, gifts to sit on them and do nothing about it. God says, I want you to use it or you're going to lose it. If you are in a job that does not use your talents to a great degree, then you are inevitably going to lose your zeal and your passion for life. It's going to burn you out and you're going to hate getting up in the morning and going to a job that does not fulfill you. And studies have shown that 70% of all Americans are in a job that does not use their talents. And that's a tragedy because God has given us each one of us gifts to use. And when we're not using them, he's grieved. And God has provided us with gifts not so that we can sit on them, but so that we can use them. Maybe you're bored at your job because you're not using your talents that God has blessed you with. And some might say that I'm advocating that if you're bored in your job that you should quit. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm trying to say is that if your talents are not being used at work, then you need to find some place that they can be used. Your life is more than your job. Believe it or not, your life is more than your job. God desires you to have a ministry. And this is why you need a ministry in the church, so that you can use the talents that are not being used in your job. So you need a job, but you also need a ministry. Remember our first passion killer, the unbalanced schedule? I am so thankful for the many, many volunteers who work in ministry at the church. Many of them work full-time jobs, and then they come in during the week or or on the weekend to do ministry. Pat and I have been there before. We worked full-time jobs, and then she was right there beside me as I directed the children's ministry long before I entered into the ministry. 
Working the job and then leading the ministry gave balance to our lives. And it will give balance to your life. But the balance will not be there if your talent is unused. You've got to have a balanced schedule. You've got to use your talent. Because if you're not, there's not that balance there. You may work in a job that does not use your God-given talent, and if that's the case, then you need to find a ministry within the church that will use that God-given talent. So you have that balance between work and ministry. The first two passions, unbalanced schedule and an unused talent. Maybe as you have looked at these first two passion killers, you realize that one or both have affected your passion and fire for Christ. And this morning, as we come to the close of the service, you're feeling that you need to come and speak to God and let him know that you are sensing that he is speaking to you this morning. And you need to tell him that you're sorry for allowing those things to cause your fire to die down or to go out. And you just need to spend a few moments at the altar this morning saying, Lord, I realize my schedule is messed up. And I realize that I'm not using it the best way. I'm either serving too much or I'm not serving enough. And Lord, I need you to help me to balance that. Because I have found out over the years that I cannot balance it. God has to balance that. You have to follow his leading in order for that to be balanced. Because if we try to balance it, it doesn't work. It's just not going to work out. So maybe this morning you just need to come to the altar and say, Lord, I need your help in this. I need you to help me balance my schedule. Or maybe God was speaking to you about the unused talent. You realize God has given you a talent and you have put the lid on it. You're not using it the way he wants you to. You're, you're so consumed with the job that you never have time to use the talent anyplace else. And for you this morning, you need to say, Lord, you gave me the talent. I don't want to lose it. So, Lord, help me know in what area of ministry or mission I need to use my talent in today. Because in order for our passion, your passion, to be re reignited, that's the only way it's going to happen is if you come to him and say, Lord, I need you to help me do that. So in just a minute, we're going to open up the altars. And I'm going to ask that if God has spoken to you this morning about your unbalanced schedule or an unused talent, I'm going to ask that you come to the altar and just spend some time with him and say, Lord, I need your help because I'm lost. I don't want us to become a people who get to the point where we say, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care about you. I don't care about them. I don't care about myself. My passion is gone. It's as cold as ice. Maybe some of you have set on your gift, your talent, for way too long. And you keep being reminded about it every now and then. But you keep pushing it down, saying, it'll go away. That feeling will go away. It will sooner or later, but so will the gift, so will the talent. So I'm asking that you stand with me this morning. We've got five more of these next week, but maybe this morning, one of these two or both of these two hit you this morning right between the eyes and said, that's what's killing my passion. That's what's burning my fire out. And you need to just come and just spend a few moments at the altar. 
If you want somebody to pray with you, I would encourage you to grab the hand of the person next to you or somebody and say, would you come and pray with me? But we're going to open up the altars. I'm going to ask that you close your eyes and bow your heads. And if God is speaking to you this morning, if God has spoken to you, come during this time and let him know what you're thinking. There are some who would like to come and just stand behind those who are praying and just letting them know that you're there for their support. Lord, we live in a world where for far too long we have listened to people who have told us that we can't be passionate about our love for you. We can't be passionate about our zeal for you. We can't be passionate about our relationship for you. And Lord, it's time that we stop listening to those people and we start listening to you where you say, you want us to love you with all our hearts, our soul, our mind, and our strength. And Lord, in order to do that, we need to be passionate about that. And Lord, I'm praying this morning that as you have spoken to hearts, that Lord, that you will continue to speak to us and help all of us to realize that if we do not start the fire, if we do not keep the fire going, that it will go out. And when that fire goes out, we just don't care anymore. We don't care about you. We don't care about us. We don't care about the person next to us. We just don't care. And Lord, that's not what you have designed us to be. That's not what you've called us to be. You've called us to be people of passion. And so Lord, I pray right now for those who have come to the altar, for those who are standing in the pew dealing with the same things right now, Lord, that you will just continue to speak to us, continue to bring us to a point where we will fall upon our knees and say, Lord, I want to be passionate again. I want my fire back. I want to feel like I did the day that I got up from asking you into my life and you forgave me of my sins. I want to feel that way again. Lord, for some of us, we just need to look at our schedule. And we need to be honest and say, I'm giving too much out and not taking enough in. Or I'm taking too much in and not giving any out. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to be able to sort through that. For some of us, Lord, it's, it's a matter of a, a talent that is being unused. We're not using it. We know it's there. We know it's ours. We know that you provided for it. But we're just not using it. And for that, Lord, 
I ask that you would help us to find that ministry, find that mission where we can use that gift. So Lord, I just pray, asking that you will be with all of us here this morning, Lord, as each and every one of us reignites the passion within us. We want to be a church that's on fire, Lord. And I just pray that you would help us to do that. So be with those who have come forward this morning. Just ask, Lord, that you would just meet them where they're at. And, Lord, as they get up from the altar this morning, they will realize that you have met with them. And, Lord, that you have heard them and that you are going to help them to accomplish what they have asked. For those who are in the pews this morning, Lord, who may not have made the step out, I just pray, Lord, that you would do the same. And for those who are watching this morning, Lord, May you do the same in their life. So, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for speaking to us this morning. Thank you for your presence here with us today. And we ask, Lord, that you will start the fire within us and have it burn brightly before the world. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I would ask those who have come to the altar this morning that before you leave today, you would just tell somebody what you have come to the altar for so that they might be able to pray with you as well. Have a great day. You are dismissed.